means something special to the shell as well. Uh, so, for example, if I try to do this, we can get it into trouble. So my verb to be the string is, essentially. And where I'd like to be able to say, hey, your username is, and then a colon, and then uh, it'll say what it's, uh, what it's actually supposed to be, what that, 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 that variable. And that would work out okay, because we did a backslash colon, which says, don't pretend that colon is one of these guys here and complain about it. It really is just a colon. So, uh, so that works. On the other hand, this doesn't. If you try to do this, you get an error message out of this uh, from this script. Let's uh, actually try. So that line worked out okay, and we get this rather annoying message here, variable syntax. Couldn't figure out what you meant. Is that colon confused? Okay. But it's a little hard to figure out where that is, or maybe even where that line is. We know it was somewhere after the last time it printed something, uh, but you don't know much more about it. So here's the, uh, the big secret. You can run the shell, CSH, with arguments, and good ones are dash XV here. And we'll run that same thing again. We can do something like that. And now this time around, as it's doing it, it's telling you what it's doing. If 5 is smaller than 3, then, well, there was some stuff I was supposed to run, but it wasn't. So that didn't happen at all. It skipped over that block of code where we were going to get that complaint. And it says, I'm about to do this, now I'm doing it. I'm about to do this, I haven't yet looked up what dollar sign user is and what dollar sign verb is. Now here it is, I've looked it up, and then here's the result of that echo command. So you, it's sort of like using a debugger, essentially, on your script with the dash x and the dash v option. That's a trick you really want to keep yourself in. All right, so now you know essentially where things died. It was on this statement here before it started to plug in the values, and then it got confused when it was trying to plug in the values, and uh, that's where it threw up its hand. And it doesn't do any more of the script. If there have been more lines there, they're not going to run. As soon as it gets confused, it doesn't try to keep going and maybe do something really bad to you. Okay. All right, so hopefully that explains uh, some of the issues you have. So you see something like variable syntax or something coming up that doesn't seem to be branching and you think it should, then um, go back and, and see what's happening. Right? You look up stuff for you as it's running through loops or whatever and tell you exactly what it's doing in each stage. And you know, if you get a number here that you didn't expect it to be saying there, you can go back and try to figure out why that's uh, really happening. Okay. On to our next video. <coughs> All right, so we're going to cycle through some arguments. This makes sense on Rohan. There is no slash op on, uh, on your NIT system, for example. Uh, so you're not going to get very interesting behavior there. But if you fiddle with this on, uh, on Rohan, uh, then you actually see some things that, uh, that happen. All right, so the same sort of setup. You have some comments and so on here. Right? And basically, this is going to look through your path. Right? Dollar sign path is your list of, um, of path names. And if we put that, that, that in here, uh, parentheses are being used in a different way. By the way, in general, parentheses you need create a subshell to run this thing. And you create a child and let the child do some stuff. But uh, parentheses can mean other things. We saw the parentheses used in this statement. Now we're seeing it used in a for each statement. So you do a for each, you give it a made up variable name that uh, you're going to iterate through. And it's going to do all the lines it finds up until the point it finds an n. Each for each has to be matched with an n statement. All right. So we look at our path and we go through this loop nine times. We have nine things in our path on, uh, on row. 
So what happens in here with a 40 shear, it's going to take each one of those um, names that we give and let my bar be assigned each of those names. So dollar sign my bar on the first time around is going to be the first element in your path. And here we're asking, you could check for like equal equal, is it exactly this particular path? But you can do equal tilde. You notice tilde means several different things to the shell depending on the context. Normally, tilde means your home directory, or tilde in some name means the home directory of that particular username. Here, with a tilde now, it means um, uh, contains, essentially. So we're going to say, hey, if this string contains those four, uh, uh, that pack, OPT with some other stuff on the behind it, then, um, so it's a pattern matching thing, then we'll do this stuff. We'll say, hey, that's underneath the slide drop. Otherwise, we'd say if it doesn't start with slash OPT, okay, it's not a very nice slash. All right, and we'll do that for each one of the different choices. Okay. And then um, what happens here, this thing is still defined when we get done. It has a variable called my bar. And the last thing it's shoved into it would still be there. So we can report on that in this case just to see that that's around. That's generally within the loops here, I'm not sure of um, what the variable is going to be. So let's, uh, let's just try this. We'll do the CSH dot dot slash CSH set. And it does indeed go through each one of those guys. Let's run the echo half phrase again. So you can see those were the last guy. And the last time around, this last name was the one that was shown there. And it does check whether those first four characters are slash off or not. So it does say yes or no in, in the appropriate places. All right, any questions on that? So some of you have scripts where you have to do things for a whole bunch of different choices. Well, obviously, for each is one of the ways to do that. We'll see some other ways. For testing arguments here, as we've seen, the syntax has lots of little things in there. It's very easy to confuse the shell if you don't get the syntax right. So um, and here I'm going to show you some tricks that you'll want to use to make sure that you don't get in trouble. Sometimes, unless you give it a, an argument that's annoying in some way, there is no uh, problem. But if you want a bulletproof script that's sort of always going to work, even if you have variable names with spaces in them and they start with dashes and stuff like that, this is the way to get around those sort of problems. All right. All right. So if we give it to say um, uh, CSH testing and we look for yes, the record I'm checking for it here, that's going to satisfy this first thing. Otherwise, we're always going to do uh, the second one. And if we don't give it a name here because we did a very bad thing here and started looking for uh, variable names. That we weren't sure were there. We have elements in the array that might be beyond the end of the array, then it's going to screw up. So under test usage, we could see how to kind of do it. And I think that's the one we just looked at. We could ask if there were enough um, names there to get to our base of one. So we do a test like this. Hey, if it's less than um, one here, then we really do want to not go ahead and try to look up our base of one because it's going to fail. All right. All right. So the um, uh, it's part of the bulletproof testing that we want to use, but not all. So what we're going to do here is first of all we're going to put quote marks around our v sub one because our v sub one might have some spaces in it, and if it does, that would be a problem because it's going to literally without the quote marks there, it really is just going to put in several different words and then equal equal and then this word out here. And that's not going to make any sense to you. We have parentheses with an equal equal and wants just one word. Now, it's already have spaces in that word, but you have to tell it that, hey, that's all one big blob. Don't treat it as several different words. And when it does the substitutions, it will make them into several words unless you use those quotes. So 
So make sure you use quotes around those just in case some joker tries to run your program with an, an argument that happens to have space in it. And now the X guy that we put in front of that, I really want RD to be yes, but I've got a capital X in front of them, and you can use almost any letter you want, so dash, uh, and it should work out uh, similarly. And we'll see why it's a bad idea to not protect the first character. You know, but uh, here we've done most of the bulletproofing except we have unwise to make sure that our D support actually exists before we try to look up who it's got. Alright, so here's what happens if we don't put the X in front of it. Let's uh, take an argument which happens to be dash D. And now if I try to do this, then it turns out the shell is going to be completely confused at that point. So again, you never get to see any other. Uh, any, any more of this script actually run. Because it turns out if with a dash D actually means something to the chef. Let's take a look at what those guys are. You can give it names of you know, paths or whatever in, in the file system and check what each of those guys turn out to, uh, to be. Oops, so you can do stuff like if uh, dash D file name, and that will tell you whether that name is a directory or not. You'll either get a true or a false coming back, a true or a one, that depends on whether it's true. And you can do a dash F to see whether it's a regular uh, file. You can do a dash Z to see if it's a zero length file. And you can do a dash O to find out whether you own this thing or not. And you can do a dash R to see whether it's readable by whoever's running the script. W to see if it's writable by whoever's writing the script, dash X, executable, and so on. So, but it is expecting something like dash D, and then just one word. So, if in this little example that we were looking at, what's going to happen after we do this substitution is going to be if dash D, right, and then a not equal sign, and then a yes, and that's too many arguments. It's expecting something like that with only two guys. It's going to see three and it's going to get confused. Now, notice if we had an X in front of both of these, this would have been X dash D, and that doesn't start with an X, so it's not going to get into this bit of confusion. And that's why we not only have the double quotes up there, but also the X. Okay, so let's fix uh, both those problems. Okay. Right, so another place you can get into trouble is have a string that has a, a, a word of zero length, the, uh, the empty string essentially, and then this uh, is, you know, doesn't look good here, but in some versions it actually does something uh, with it. So uh, it's willing to consider that okay, but that uh, you know, it's kind of an odd example. So now next one here is for how you concatenate strings together. Sometimes you have to build up longer words from pieces of smaller words. You may find that useful in some of the assignments. And this shows some of the pitfalls that can happen when you do uh, that. All right, so I picked kind of a complicated and easy example just to show you some of the issues that you may have to, uh, have to work with. All right. Yeah, among the things you can do here is you could, early in your script, while you're debugging it, set echo here, and that's sort of like having that dash, uh, dash x option uh, available to you. And then uh, you can also do a similar thing for like uh, set for books, essentially. Let's see, set echo, set for books, that's like the dash x option and the dash d option. So it's probably more convenient to just run the script with dash x and dash d rather than putting these lines in there and then later having to do an erase and a comment on that. Alright. Alright, so if you do that, you get kind of what we've seen before when I was showing you the debugging on the other one, ways to uh, see what's actually going on in your program. So another possibility of putting x and the v up there. And then when you fully debug your script, take out those two characters. That way you also have to be practical. But notice with this, you can uh, do set echo and later unset echo. So you might turn it on through just one little portion of a big long script so you see carefully what's going on there and then turn it back off so you don't get uh, um, a, a 
whole bunch of extra output about things you don't really care about. So this is the way to go if you want to sort of turn that on and off selectively in different places in the stream. Okay. Right. So in our case here, we're going to set the, again, just a, um, a made up name here, ops here. I'm going to an option here that we're going to give to, I think, the cat command. So options and this is going to be cat dash n that happens here. But we could change it to something else. Right? If we have a, um, a different argument that we want, under some circumstances, we could set op to be a different thing. Right? And then, so one way to do this is to have two different cat statements here, two big long statements, one with a dash n, one with a dash d, or whatever it is you want to happen. But, um, you could combine them all with just one big long statement by setting some variable names and assigning them before you execute that statement. This shows a little bit about how to, uh, how to do that. Right. Right. So spaces, by the way, are needed there. We really want the shell to see this as one, two, three different words. Now, I don't need a space here. It's just like uh, I can say, um, um, you know, cat less than something or other, not the spaces around the less than side. Some things are keywords in and of their, uh, of their own, even if you don't put spaces on either side. And the parentheses work like that, but equal equal does not work like that. You really do have to have the, the spaces around for that uh, measure here in this Alright. So if it turns out, instead of using an X, this time I use a, uh, a dot. A dot and the R D to one matches dot D. You know, it's an R D to one, it really was just a single C. Then we'll set our option to be that D dot rather than the uh, end. Yeah. So we'll override that option in some cases. So sometimes we do cap dash N, other times we do cap dash D. Right. So that's what's uh, essentially being discussed here. And uh, I think four or five people have gotten script that they need to do to write. And here's one example of some of the things that you can do uh, with R. And we're doing kind of a simple thing here. In general, awk can have a pattern that you match first. What awk does is go through any file that you give it line by line. And if you match whatever pattern that you want, then you do whatever it says in these um, brackets. Which have to be quoted because brackets mean something special to the shell uh, as well. All right. Now, if you don't give it a pattern in there, then it just doesn't get a single one, and that's what's going to happen to us, uh, to us here. Uh, it has a generic print statement that you can use within a So, often what you want to do is print something out for each line. That will be useful for um, some of the things that some people are doing. And uh, it uh, also identifies different words on a line. So, for example, you can give it your password file and tell it the word separator character is colon with a dash something or other. I forget quite what, what, what that is. And then you would have seven different fields that it could look at. And you could ask it for any one of those fields. By default, the separator is white space. If there is a space or a tab between the two things, those are considered two separate words on the line. So it reads words in the way normal humans would think of the word what words are separated by space and tabs and so on. Alright. Now dollar sign zero prints the whole thing, the entire line uh, that you have. You can do dollar sign one to find the first word on, on that particular line. Dollar sign two would give you the second word on that line. Dollar sign three would be the third word. Those of you who are required to use the awk script, um, those are going to be interested in getting those different uh, um, columns essentially printed out for so this is why some of you are awk. Other folks, if I don't insist that you use awk, you could use it, but probably you don't really need it. There's probably faster ways to get to the answers that that matching to the Alright, well, our issue here is that we want to use dollar sign zero on two different if we pass along a dollar sign zero to the off script, that really does mean, hey, print this whole line, whatever it is. 
but we've already seen plain old dollar sign zero if the shell gets its rubby little paws on it. That means the name of the script that we're running right now. It's like dollar sign one in its first argument. So I want to do both here. I want to use dollar sign zero to really look up the name of the script that I'm running, but I also want to use dollar sign zero to um, be passed along to the off script so they can use it the way it's supposed to use the pattern dollar sign zero and they print the whole line. All right, so each time we do this, we're going to print out some stuff. We're going to print out script name and the actual name of the script, and then we're going to print out the, the, the line value here and then the line that's in there. Now, to be able to do that, though, I have to give off a given pattern. What I'm going to give it is these characters. That's a single quote mark there. So it's going to take all of these characters right up until that quote mark. And um, that's going to be part of what we give to off. We're going to concatenate onto that dollar sign zero. We're outside the single quotes now. So the shell is going to go substitute the name of our script here in, the, in this little spot. And then I'm quoting again here. These guys are going to be passed along verbatim. And in particular, a dollar sign is going to be passed to the script along with that zero and these parentheses. Right? So the shell doesn't really even know there's a parenthesis there or a dollar sign there because of this quote. Notice that CSH has two different types of quote marks that you can use. You can use double quotes. And those group words together, we saw that in the test argument script a little while ago. Or you can use single quotes. And it's nice to have both, because sometimes you want to quote something that's got double quotes in it, or you might want to quote something that has single quotes in it. So use the other kind of quotes to, uh, to get them. The other way around that would be backslash quotes with a real quote test. But we don't need to do that if we use those single quotes. All right, so it turns out that will do what we want. Here's a much simpler example, which will show you how things actually get uh, put together. And we can string variable names together and uh, to give you that. All right, so um, if I wanted to take so to illustrate string concatenation, we have this ridiculous thing. Dollar sign zero, it's not inside quote marks here, so it really is going to look up the name of this script and pretend that's what we, uh, we typed there. In quotes here, we have quote, foo, quote. And that really is just the word foo. So right after the name of the script, we're going to get um, the word foo essentially coming out. Right? You're going to get this, the name of the script, Right after that, the food, the bookmarks disappear. Then I put bar on the end of that. Right? That would be this really stuff here. Then I told it print an X. Then I said, here, give me the alternate value for a Y. But there is no alternate value for a Y. A Y is just a Y, luckily, in the shell. So it just prints the Y. And Z is Z. So that thing winds up printing like that, essentially. And that's the same spirit that we're doing here to get like three different pieces concatenated together, one right next to each other, uh, to send along the appropriate thing to the, uh, to the office. All right. Now, there is one other way that you might find useful, and I didn't have a full write-up on this, but it is on page 18. There's another possibility for, uh, for doing things using the shift argument. So I want to go over how shift works here. <coughs> right, so you can do a while loop here, or for each if you want it, but while well, is the appropriate thing to name the shifts. Uh, and in your case, uh, to illustrate things here, I stopped at three. But typically, if you're going to do this, it would be while argv is greater than 1. While there's at least one more argument to process, do this stuff. And there's also a shift that you can use in, in C, by the way, to, to deal with the command line arguments uh, uh, as well. But uh, we really don't care about how it works. If, let's say that we ran this, uh, this little script here, my script, 
A, B, C. Well, to begin with, right, this guy is dollar sign zero. This one is um, dollar sign one, or R to B sub one. That one is dollar sign two. That guy is dollar sign three. And so here I'm telling it to echo dollar sign one, which would be an A. That would be the first thing that comes up. An A would get that. And then we're telling it to shift, which does this essentially here. After you do a shift, that, that is as though I have now at this point my script B C. A is no longer the dollar sign one. It's gone. So if you need it, you better remember in the bear the name something uh, because you're not going to find it again. Later. This now becomes dollar sign one. That guy becomes dollar sign two. So if I were to go back up to the top of the loop and pass the test again, which we would if I put a one there, if there's a well, greater than zero, I guess it would make the most sense if you want to do all these other Now I'll print out the new dollar sign one. That's going to be the B. So we have printed out an A. Now right next to it is going to be a B. Uh, that's because I have a dash N argument here. That means no new line. Don't just print A along the line. Just print an A and stop and be ready to print a character right next to that A. And so a B would actually come out uh, next to it. Be, uh, it can be this sort of loop. Okay. And um, do that thing and then shift again. And you can imagine what happens. You're going to get something as though it looked like you had my script with just a C up. The B disappears. That's now the new dollar sign one. So you should do it again and uh, go down through this thing. The number of arguments you have now is one. It had been three. That thing evaluated to three at that point. Once you did the shift, it evaluates to two. Now it evaluates to one. So there is only one argument. So we would do this again and print that guy. A C would come out. And then we go back again after doing another shift, and that would have been just my script. And there are then no more arguments after that. We would no longer be greater than zero. Consequently, we go past the end and exit. And then without putting a new line on the end of it. So your prompt would come back uh, right after that C, not on the line by itself. All right, now, by the way, it's also possible to uh, catch signals in C and also in bash and sh. Uh, you set up a signal catcher, which I don't think is needed in any one of the assignments that I've sent out. Uh, you say, on any kind of an interrupt, uh, go down to that line uh, called my catcher and do those statements to come after that. So that's the way you can do that. Uh, bash and sh is much more sophisticated. You can tell it which signals you want to go to and what you want to do in those, uh, in those situations. So here we could say, we'll do a track command here. A signal one or a signal two comes in, then where and that's a up signal, and I forget what the second one is here. But if you send it the, the signal one or the signal two, then it does this and dies, no matter where it is elsewhere in the program. So you have a bit more flexibility on the dash, which is again why most um, system administration programs are written in um, SH4 dash rather than CSH. CSH and TCSH are really nice. Command line. Um, and Bash is pretty good at the command line as, uh, as well. But the writing scripts, the uh, and Bash is the better thing. You may have noticed when you look at some scripts that are uh, being used, and we haven't really done that um, chapter of the book yet. Um, they're, they're pretty much all Bash scripts. All right, so that should give you some background for how to use this programming language, essentially, that's the uh, C shell. Um, have you sent the homework assignment yet? I mean, where, where were we getting? Uh, assignment one should have been sent to your Legolas account. Legolas so account. wherever Legolas is forwarding things, that's where you would get it from. But I got like two bounces, and I don't know who they were from here, so it might have been my bounce if you haven't seen it. If you haven't gotten an assignment from you know, email, you know, try to fix it up. Plus, then also, you know, you've got a problem with Legolas. Right. right, any questions about the. So we have a couple of weeks to try to figure that sort of thing out. Should it be in our Rohan account too? Or just like uh, I just sent it to Rohan if you uh, to Legolas. And if you're doing what I suggested, that should have been forwarded over to your Rohan account. And again, 
from there, presumably you also forward it to your some other account that you would If you didn't get one, you know, one of those things happened, or maybe you know, Gmail or whatever you decided to send in a spam, so look at your spam folder as well uh, to see what they've done. So I believe we're on page 164 of Lab 7. Yeah. Uh, when is lab seven due? Um, I haven't put a due date on there, but certainly not before. I'm kind of thinking it's right in, but um, and I'm thinking of the Tuesday before Thanksgiving as uh, the last eight thing. So somewhere in between there, I want to do these two things, but I haven't, um, haven't got the two dates done either. So I have a little more time last night. I probably figured that out, but I'm lucky to just get the the right, so we got to a kind of stopping place last time in the, in the labs where we're not ready to tell it to go and spend a lot of time sucking stuff off the DVD or so. Uh, and you should see some stuff go by. You're still sitting around watching what's happening there. It will tell you that it's you know, preparing the disk, which means it's you know, trying to format that empty space that we uh, created for it. And then it will tell you that it's deploying images, it's putting in some of the, uh, the binaries that it's going to use to, uh, to build them. And indeed, you can go down to details here, and instead of seeing the little all right, so after that, so start putting things actually onto the system, that's why it's not the end And this is going to go on for a, a while. All right, so at some times, a few of the groups have to report there was some failed uh, packages here. We generally don't want to do that. And when uh, um, a group had that happen to them, if they just sort of started over, uh, then it would work just fine the next time around. Mm -hmm. So I'm not quite sure what would cause that. So the exact same thing again, it worked uh, fine. So hopefully you won't run into that. But uh, if you do get failed packages, just trying to plow ahead, you know, there might be some stuff missing, which means in the next lab something that is not going to work and you're pulling your hair off and figure out what's wrong. Right. So it would be best to just go back and do some of those kind of things. You may recall what we did, there were a few experiments we did, like uh, you know, trying to delete Ruby to do and then put it back in. Obviously, we can skip over those extra side steps. We didn't really change anything. We do have some new stuff. Right, but eventually it'll get to this is finishing the basic installation of the screen. And um, at that point, it's going to want to try to. Uh, Reboot the system. If you still have the DVD in there, then you're going to get the same screen you started out with here, but now uh, you can just have it boot from the hard disk. So you could avoid it taking that DVD if you can do the disk. You have to just have a copy of the DVD. So during the, uh, the reboot process, you can make that stuff. Or just click on the option. So now it should have uh, come up with a new menu here. It should have figured out where everything was. And I'm expecting to see something along the lines of this. Seeing two places where Windows 1 is open, and one of them boots, you really have to go to the other <coughs> two here. Uh, it couldn't really tell you know, which was the right one to work with here. So it's stuck in both of them in one way. Uh, but it does have the open CG thing here. It, it should have noticed that you do have NIP. So you could get your old NIP system back by. Rather than choosing an after call and going down to this one and doing it, in, which we'll need to do later on in the uh, semester. And there's still, again, those advanced options for that that if you go to the CD and so on. It could also give you advanced options to do the CD and so on. It's easy. All right. So 
So basically, it is put in that first installation. It also created a file under bar list and yes, too. Again, we'll go back to yet another setup tool. This is the graphical version of it. Two young men right there. That's the little thing called run me a piece. That file is there, then it knows it's really kind of in the middle of the installation. It isn't really done doing it. But up until this point, it was running one of those copy on write systems where it pulled its operating system off of the DVD itself. And that was the thing that was running. Now, when it did the revisit, it's running on the actual kernel that's on your, your hard drive at this point. And that's the stuff that was on the DVD, the stuff that it copied from the DVD. So now that that version is up, continue from there to, uh, to set things up. And so there's a lot of things you couldn't really do very well as, uh, uh, like it wasn't really running in the native um, currency. That's now on your disk drive. Huh. All right, so we have to now get different times that the things that I'm describing here occasionally get done in different orders. Sometimes some of them don't come up on um, you know, what hardware that you've, uh, you've seen. So don't feel um, too worried if um, you don't get to see a particular screen uh, along the way. You may not see some of the new uh, guys. Right. So there might be some topics that pop up here about how you know, looking for a graphics card, trying to do the best drive you can stuff here, and so we're going to see if things go to the even if you're not there watching, it's already too. It shouldn't require any too many dimensions. So we'll write a bunch of configuration files here once it figures out you know, where it's supposed to uh, go to to, uh, to get out to the rest of the world and so on. And we'll have gotten some of that uh, information off of DHCP. They've got a lot more information than, uh, than this one. As soon as you'll figure out what you're really saying, I'm going to have got that in another folder. We have to tell him what your name was, but Susie doesn't uh, do that. Alright, so if it just says Linux login rather than SAM login or Proto login or something like that, it hasn't really uh, figured out the information from, um, from Legos. I believe I have that set up right, so I haven't changed anything since uh, last fall, so it should be okay. And at least one of your, your guys can now say it's Sam again, so it's uh, not true. But it seems to be okay. Alright, so uh, that's, we do need to tighten up some security and stuff on here, but if you're going to try your same run that machine, this is a good time to uh, quit. And again, uh, there is a DVD that you can install now. Right now, it's sitting on top of a SAM machine, I think. Um, so that's where you'll find it for the next week. All right, so we're going to go All right, now, if we do all this stuff, and for some reason, nothing wants to do for you, hopefully that, that, that isn't going to happen. Right? But on, uh, unless we somehow blown away the SDA 5 partition, we should be able to get things uh, back with a few tour and the sort of things that you might uh, have to do to, uh, to make that work. Alright. So, you could go back to your mid uh, installation DVD and bring up a system there. Don't tell it to reinstall, but just tell it to uh, mount the appropriate uh, device. <laughs> so, if you dev SDA5 is where we put the you know, main portion to mid. So we can mount that on a subdirectory, kind of like in the disaster recovery uh, page that we looked at in the uh, and, uh, right? and then we can tell it, hey, let's do a grub install, we install it with our root directory being down here in mount, and uh, put that on the uh, uh, master root record that we tried to So whatever Susie attempted to put there, this would then over right. Again, you don't do this unless uh, you know, that's the sort of thing you should be able to do when you pretty much get it back fairly quickly. Again, assuming you haven't destroyed the SDA file. And we tried to be careful with that when we were shrinking partitions, etc. We were looking at the starting um, number for SDA5 and the ending number 
for SDA5, and you're not supposed to proceed unless when you got done, those numbers are still the same as they were before, and you make sure that you weren't reformatting that thing and um, you know, you know, you know, you know. So if you follow these um, the precautions that we had earlier on highly the whole Okay, all right, so that should get you the menu, the menu back, and indeed, um, it, it may even find the Susie installation there that looks like something that might, uh, might be. So uh, once we get that back, we could tell it, that, hey, look at the configuration file. Look all around at all these partitions, find out what you can find. And this time, it should find not just Windows and Mint, but maybe it will find the Susie uh, thing too. Right? So we would tell it, make a new configuration file. Normally, we just write that up in the screen. But we Overwrite our old configuration file. Of course, you got to the point where you're doing this, before you blow this away, it would be a good idea to check in the old version and get the new thing that was even more broken than the old thing. But then get a new one and maybe even that new one. That's again, all stuff that probably does not need to be done by this person. Alright, so we should be able to get in as loser with the testing password uh, again. That needs to work out by the now, if we do a full view with the dash R option here, that it says, tell me what run level we're at. And it should say that we were at uh, run level 3. That's the way we set it up to get a non graphical interface. But we're going to try to change that as we go along. So, uh, you need to do something we have to do with root, so if we're not really at the moment, then we really don't need to be in the case where we're regular. You need to use CD in that uh, and tell us to admit the file. Now, so far, you've been used to being asked for your own password if you're going to use the CD command. That's not the way CD works. CD wants to root password. So I can't do a CD on CD because I have no idea what you've chosen for a uh, root password. Now, what I have to do is SU to the JC account, which is what I can do. It. I do have a password for that one. And then I can start doing so what should happen when you tell it to admit the file, at this point it's supposed to start up the uh, display manager and bring up a graphical screen. Uh, it will be mostly green rather than the pretty pictures that you were getting with uh, Mint, but they will replace you with what you were using and you were password or something. And log you into the graphical uh, menu. So that's basically what you should get there. Try it as a user uh, first, because that's the one guy that we've, uh, we've set up somewhere. All right. So we now, assuming we uh, got our packages correctly and installed a TCSH program, we should be able to sue the TCSH right away. And then again, we had to do an aptitude install of that stuff uh, before we could use TCSH. But here, during the installation process, Selected tons and tons of packages for Susie. So it gave the installation go a lot slower than it might even when it was installed to the rack. Alright, so if we do a dash R now, it should report to one level 3 anymore. It should tell you to do one level 5. Okay. Alright, now, um, the SAM group already tried this, the ID1 from ID3 to ID5. See a NIT tab, it says, you know, how we're supposed to come up by uh, default. And I changed it from a 3 to a, uh, to a 5, but then when they rebooted it, it didn't work very well. So I'm wondering if we really do need to do this from the ASP. I'm pretty sure this is the way we did it last semester, but just a warning that I'm going to do have a little bit of trouble with this uh, already. So that should work, and a reboot should get you back in. If not, you can, you know, become the user and then uh, uh, become the root. And we switch it back to, to three. So we may have to do this with yes too. I'm not quite sure about that yet. So if you have success with that step or trouble with that step, do report back to you on the you know, after you see what happens on the next uh, reboot. And I'll put something in a lot of time that you need to uh, update them here. Alright. Now I'm I'm picking an older version here, so the repositories that the 
specs decline and any updates on them aren't really there anymore. There are limits out on the net, and I'm not going to really dive on that, but we're not really going to point to those things. And I didn't really want to update it too much because we're going to be messing with the kernel and know exactly how that goes with this older version without the updates. So we're going to stick with the old out of date SUSE system uh, just to let you know. But in general, you want to upgrade to the most recent long-term support version if you want to use this seriously on your own. But again, uh, Susie is probably not a very good choice for your own personal Linux system, something like that. Too much trouble. All right. Let's see. Let's now we're going to steal a whole bunch of stuff from the slash mint file system, which presumably we set up correctly earlier on. It was supposed to be numbed automatically for it, which meant when uh, we did the installation in the Etsy FS tab file, the file system table link, there should have been one saying, hey, now dev SDA5 on slash mint, which means you have access to all the stuff underneath your own directory. So you can have a good uh, CSHXC file and so on, uh, pretty much for free. Okay, all right, now let's see what it takes to get out into the real world. Um, again, remember that was something that we had to do in Lab 1 as a special thing. You know, even by default, we weren't set up to uh, use SSH. But we changed something in the, uh, um, in the installation scripts there. Specifically, you said, hey, make sure SSH is up and running. So, hopefully, this does work for you now that you've done that. So, if you should have done that, it should take you over to Legolas here. And um, if you were able to use the name Legolas, that means you can figure out you know, where this uh, place is. If it doesn't know about Legolas, you could try 10.0.0.1. It's an internet address. But, uh, it's one of those all right, so get yourself over to Legos if you know you actually know of it. And then try to come back to your workstation and see if that, uh, that works. Now, depending on whether we um, insist on strict checking or not, it may just not let you log in. If it says, hey, there's, I'm looking at the, the special code for this machine here, and it looks different than what I remember. Um, Sam or Kroger or whatever having you. Which sort of makes sense. Um, we had um, reinstalled a different operating system, but it's now at the same address that was there before, and it looks different than it did before. So generally, SSH wants to at least warn you about it, and maybe just refuse to let you uh, connect. Right? So you can look up the idea of Trojan horse here in Nemeth, essentially, because someone else could have a machine on the network. They pretend to be one of these other things. You politely try to log into that and give away your password and so on. So uh, SSH tries to prevent that sort of thing from happening. Somebody else pretending to be your workstation and uh, tricking you into uh, giving away passwords and such. All right. All right. So we could do that to collect a bunch of things and uh, maybe even. Uh, Direct you to the right place that you're going to go, so you just thought you just got your password. Alright, so we're going to give you a unique ID for each of these machines. You didn't get that back in lab one, and now Susie did it, and almost certainly it's not the same big long line of gibberish that you uh, that did. And in the known host file, we put those pieces of gibberish, those identifications that have come back. So if you get a different one, uh, then it tells you that. Um, there's a problem. Now, if we were never going to use Mint again, and we were just going to use Susan, well, we'd just take out the old line, the known host, and let it use this new one. So we're going to be doing both things uh, uh, on and off, and we don't want to keep going through that over and over again. But the rational thing to do is just make the two machines match. We already have things set up for Mint, so what we want is for the Susie uh, magic gibberish to match the uh, magic gibberish we have on Mint. It's going to be easy to do because the new partition is already numbered. So they could even be no matter of trying to copy it elsewhere and then copy it back. Even though it's going to be All right. So usually, if we're going to change something, we check in the old changes and then put the new things on top. 
Uh, so you may be tempted to do that, and be okay. But I'm certainly not going to insist that you do this, because we really are going to throw away these randomly generated things that we're seizing, and we don't really care what they look like. So it's not something that you really don't have to uh, say. So it's very fun not to say this, even though we're about to override 665. So occasionally there's some. Now, um, on SINSI, there is uh, Etsy SSH, where you would expect. And over on NIMP, it was called Etsy SSH. But when we have um, SUSE booted to find the, that stuff from NIMP, it's now under slash NIMP, slash SSH. The two places where they are. I want to copy some stuff from here over to there. But I don't want to copy everything, in particular if you look at the SSH. SSHD config file from Mint is different than the one from SUSE. And we'll probably just ask you for trouble if we uh, get to the Mint one and uh, expect SUSE to uh, be happy with that. But it's those keys that we want to move. So every file name that has the word key in it somewhere are exactly the guys that we want to move. So put anything in front of KDY plus anything behind that. And move all of those files, stick them into this directory using the same names that it had before. That should uh, take care of it. And almost, we changed some of the startup files, and the SSH team has no clue that we did that yet. We have to tell it to reload this. We can either tell it to stop and start, re, uh, and restart, or in this case, um, one of the things that the service call has that SSH uh, pays attention to is the idea to reload. Not saying what we uh, uh, demons running, but just relook at the configuration get a new idea of how to do So, start up the service again, and now when you try the SSH from Legolas back over to this uh, machine, uh, it should be happy with it. If it is getting the, the appropriate identification, it's got to be expected to see it as if you were running it. Alright. Okay, everyone understand the issue? Yeah, that's yeah, kind of a good exam question. Uh, why did we do that? Is the point of doing what happens if we don't do that and so on. Uh, so make sure you are um, happy with what it's going to do. Okay, so now we're going to add uh, a lot of the same accounts that we had uh, before. This might be a misprint. I don't think we had a Z root uh, the last time around. I've got to look that up again. I don't think we did that. We did. We did. There's no Z root. There's no error. Oh, let's see, an actual one. Okay, fine. So, uh, yeah, then we can get out of that. I'll try to remember to put that in the URL. Let's send an email. This would be uh, a great help. Uh, I'll try to do it. So, you do the same things that we have done before in uh, in or less the same uh, way. Okay. Except, we don't have to do a whole lot to set up people's home directories because we already have perfectly good home directories mounted. You may as well use the same old directory on, uh, when you're booting SUSE as you have when you're booting uh, NIMP. Okay. All right, so let's see here. Uh, uh, normally, what we did when we set up the Carol account, uh, we said slash home slash Carol. Right? That's where it lived on NIMP. Um, I want you to give me the same home directory that we had before, and the easiest way to do that is in the password file say, hey, this is going to be slash, slash mint slash home slash get. And then I'll do the same spot. Right, now there's a little bit of inconvenience when we do this. Um, your home directory, somewhere underneath there, it stores you know, what uh, um, graphical interface you like to have, whether it's um, the GNOME interface or the major interface. Or whether it's, in our case, a KDE. And depending on who you boot, it's going to be so sort of surprised that there was a different uh, value given there, and we'll let you go back and deal with it. You know, so you have to change those things around. Luckily, they use separate configuration files, though, for KDE, because they have a bunch of doc files underneath your home directory for KDE, and they're mostly separate from the doc file underneath your home directory for, um, for me. So you can sort of set up both ways here. 
I hope you click with each other too much, except for the one little file which says what your preferred uh, graphical interface is. And that's something you have to bounce back and forth. All right, so uh, as I said, if you just adjust the paths correctly, everyone's already going to have a home directory that's populated with the uh, stuff that they like. You're going to get your own old CSHRC file back for free when you set up your accounts. Now, eventually, we're going to set up accounts for the entire class, but for this lab, I'm just asking you to do it for the, uh, the administrators themselves. I do the home uh, account for some of the very involved uh, uh, names we go with. Okay. Alright, so you can copy some of the lines out of the um, shadow file, etc., and stick them into this other file, etc. Now, um, one good way to get some of this stuff, since it's almost the same here, is to do a DI on two separate files. And I know we should use DI PW, but that only lets you work on one file at a time. And I guess there is a way around that, but I would suggest that it's uh, for just one weird time. Let's just use regular DI rather than DI PW. Alright, because mostly I want to show you another little trick for copying stuff between files. All right, so once you have one BI session set up, I'm willing to look at several files here. You can yank stuff into your buffers, and you can actually yank a whole bunch of different things, because besides the unnamed buffer which we've been using, uh, there are also a bunch of named buffers. You can put something in buffer A, something in buffer B, something in buffer capital A. You have like 50 some of different uh, named buffers which you would be allowed to uh, work. But you may as well do it. So if you can find a line that you want to copy, or maybe if you're with four lines and, and yank it, or it's four lines and yank four lines, it's a bunch of lines you want to move, and stick them into your unmoved buffer. Then we can go on and edit the next file. Colon n takes you to the next file that was in your list. And that would be the actual password file now for this thing. And you can do a control G to see what the name of the file is you have, so you don't uh, get these things back in. And of course, this can be a much smaller file than the one you had on Mint, and the Mint had 38 uh, user names plus all the administrator names uh, in there as well. And we're just going to copy over five names and some of those uh, group accounts and so on. Alright, so you can go in there and put that stuff back. This is a paste of the copy lines into the uh, new file. And that, that part went well. You may as well call it up and write out those little bit of changes because maybe the next time you do something, you kind of screw it up and it's easier to just stop and start all over again with the same DI. So once you have stuff that you know, any change that looks good to you, you write out. Okay, now if you call it and then pound E, that takes you back to the previous file that you were editing. And that's the one over on the middle part here. And now you can go. Cut and paste, or cut another line out of that one, go back, pull it in to the next one, pull it in uh, to the next one, and then take it back and forth between the last few things that you've ever done. And we'll work with that again. And then the control G will show you the name of the current one in case you get lost as you're in the All right. So we really do want to leave the eye and start editing the shadow file on the two different systems and copy some things over there. So, or if you'd rather, you can just type in the password and not have to worry about that because some of the accounts are correct. You just keep the old ones and then you've got exactly the same password that you had before on your workstation. Okay. Oh, I see, yeah, your own password entry is not the shadow. So do that, get your own some individual lines in the file, then do a similar thing up there with the two different shadow files you can have That's probably a pretty good stopping point for today. It's just not a problem. Alright. I'm gonna upload it to YouTube. YouTube? Yeah. What's the YouTube URL? Uh, just text me and I'll send it to you. I don't have your uh, I'll keep it my 619.
That's right. Alright. Tomorrow at 10? Yeah. Or should text me as like, let's just get more attention. Yeah, we're going to You want to send me the link to your, uh, today's box? Of course, my singers. What? I said yes. This is really good. I don't have a problem. Is it private? No. No, it's not.